I'm asking you right now to welcome Derek Small so he can talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Could 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 you could someone give me a bottle of water from the, the back? There Just, there. Yeah, no, the other one. The the blue. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay, sorry, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Really glad to be here. And uh, sorry we're a little bit late. We uh, kept on, we saw 8th and 10th Street, but we kept missing 9th. So we were doing the little merry-go-round. I got it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So we did the merry-go-round a few times, but now we're here. So thank you for waiting patiently. And thank you, Eric, for that great uh, introduction. And thank you to our volunteers that were here. Um, and thank you to people who have, have been at other places and are here to see us tonight. You know, it's, um, our country right now is at, a, is at a turning point, it's at a tipping point. And, you know, a lot of Canadians sense it. Not everyone maybe knows exactly what's going on. I mean, you know, I don't know everything that's going on. But the fact is, is, is that there's a lot of smoke, and not just in Canmore, <laughs> but there's a lot of smoke across the country. There's a lot of smoke coming out of the Prime Minister's office. And where there's smoke, there's fire. As we all know, we can't see the fire from here, but we can tell that there's a fire. And we are um, seeing some of the most uh, blatant incursions on our liberties in this country. We're seeing some of the most blatant bureaucratic overreach. And we're seeing basically, um, you know, complicity and lying and cowardice on grand scales when it comes to what our government leaders are doing, what our health officials are doing. And, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, Canada has kind of bought into the worst elements of this. Now, you know, it's, it's been bad in, in many other places. But Canada has, um, well, when it, it, initially, of course, they said that COVID-19 wasn't an issue at all, but then they soon began to backtrack on that. And they began to, um, you know, uh, uh, harp on, you know, numbers that, uh, you know, inflated numbers that, that treated this as if it was the end of the world. They then um, refused after a few, uh, you know, I remember hearing on the news uh, briefly about a year ago that, you know, a un one of the universities in, in Alberta was going to do a test on, you know, hydroxychloroquine and some of these drugs that were being used elsewhere. And then, you know, two weeks later, that was the last I ever heard of that. So there was, a, there was a complete refusal to look at any other option to treat COVID, even those that were being used in other jurisdictions. And they shut us down completely without any scientific rationale uh, for months on end. And different provinces had it differently. But we all uh, faced, um, you know, complete shutdowns for a period of time. And, and places like Toronto were shut down entirely for eight months. Like no indoor shopping, no indoor dining, um, you know, no gathering outside uh, in groups greater than five. Um, you know, this is the, I mean, there was times when people were getting tickets for playing basketball in parks by themselves. Um, you know, this is the type of thing that we were seeing. And, you know, I mean, if, if, um, if people wanted to be, if the government wanted to, you know, overreact for a couple of weeks or something, I mean, we might have been able to forgive them. But this went on for months and months and months. And notwithstanding, you know, much data to the contrary, they kept on going against the data and, you know, uh, putting us in, in a medical tyranny without so much as, um, you know, without so much as uh, a second thought. And the, the concern that I have is kind of multifold. One is, you know, um, the power of groupthink in government is so expansive that nobody is willing to, you know, speak up. You know, there's a few isolated cases of, you know, doctors and so on, but they're not the ones making the decisions. And thank God for these doctors that are willing to, you know, speak up. And there's some politicians that are willing to speak up. Thank God for them too. But nobody in the actual position of authority, you know, the doctors that are speaking up aren't the ones, aren't the chief health officers. They're, you know, credible people that are working elsewhere. So this is the type of thing that we were seeing uh, you know, across the country. And we're seeing this pervasive groupthink and we're, and we're seeing, you know, the government uh, continually change their minds. And there was an interesting article that I posted on uh, my Facebook uh, just, just recently. 
and it had a nice intro, and I don't have it here with me, so I can't go through it all, but it had a great intro, just going through kind of what the government said at the beginning and what it's saying now. And it was like 30 statements of like, we're not moving the goalposts, we are moving the goalposts. Um, you know, uh, the, the, stop trying to take, uh, you know, we're not, uh, it, don't accuse us of taking advantage of this for, you know, uh, taking advantage of this crisis. And then the next one is like, but this is such a great opportunity. I mean, it's 30 statements of the government saying like one thing and then the exact opposite over and over. You know, initially they're like, you know, um, you know, herd immunity means a combination of people who are vaccinated, unvaccinated, and people who have, you know, recovered from the illness and are now immune. That's what they used to say. Now they're saying, you know, forget the carrot. If you haven't been vaccinated, we need a stick. Okay. And so they, they keep on changing what they're saying. They keep on, you know, if we say they're using this crisis, you know, as an opportunity, they say, oh, well, you're conspiratorial. And then the very next day, Justin Trudeau is saying, well, you know, this is a great opportunity to rebuild better and all this type of thing. So they're, they're speaking out of both sides of their mouth and they keep changing what they're saying. And what we're seeing, of course, is there's, there's no guarantee that we're not gonna see lockdowns again. Okay, of course, we're, we're open for the summer. But, you know, I'll tell you something. I just had my staff do some research and I don't have my phone on me, so I, I can't give you the exact numbers. But did you know that in July of this year, where, you know, somewhere between, well, 70% of Canadians have, a, have had at least one vaccine, okay? Maybe a little bit more. Okay, okay, perfect. He's got it for me right here. Okay, so who, who, would, who would believe that COVID cases in July of this year are more than July of last year. So last year, nobody was vaccinated, okay, right? Because we didn't have a vaccine. This year in Canada, 15,199 cases of COVID in this July. Last year, 12,103, okay? And the, de and, and the deaths are actually slightly less, although some provinces, they're more. But listen, if the vaccine is the cure-all, why? Are we seeing, you know, an uptick in cases? And, and if, you know, and then they're saying that uh, they're blaming this on all unva unvaccinated people. Okay. Now, listen, there may be some people here that got vaccinated and that's, that's fine. That's, and you had the choice to do that. But now what we're seeing is I'm getting emails from people. Their son or daughter has a scholarship to play sports somewhere or is playing high level hockey in certain provinces. And these young, healthy people who will never die from COVID they're far more likely to die from almost anything else, have to be vaccinated, fully vaccinated to participate in these programs. You know, we're having the president of Mexico say he's not gonna vaccinate uh, minors because he doesn't feel it's necessary. And he says he's gonna wait until he sees the data because he doesn't want to enrich the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, listen, this is Mexico. Now, nothing against Mexico, but the fact is, is that we here are being, um, fed a line and they're continually saying oh everyone has to be vaccinated this that and the other thing and they keep pumping the fear they keep pumping the this narrative and it's wrong and what we're seeing going on at the same time is this internet censorship okay so there's bill c10 and there's bill c36 but there's something even worse than that so there's, there's an there's a article I was just reading today. The Liberals put out a consultation, a, 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 a basically a, a, their ideas for what they want to do with this online harms legislation. So this is legislation that is not out yet, okay? But what it would do is it would, it would basically make for an office of an official kind of censor, okay? They don't call it that, but some of uh, pre, uh, Gilbo's notes talk about it this way, okay? His notes use this language. And what, this, what their legislation would do is it would force uh, fa the Facebooks of the world, these type of companies, to pull down offensive content in 24 hours, okay? Now, offensive content could be things that are actually offensive, like, for example, um, uh, you know, nude photos that are being shared without consent, this type of thing. Um, you know, and, and other kind of sexualized photos and violence. But it also could be, in their words, propaganda or hate speech. 
And if these companies don't pull this stuff down in 24 hours, if they're caught uh, doing this, they could be fined up to $10 million, okay? So what we're gonna see, and I was reading, there's a good professor at the University of Ottawa, his name's Michael Geist. He's not a conservative or a liberal, he just, you know, but his, his profession, is, his focus is on this sort of online stuff. And he was saying that, you know, what's going to happen is all these companies, you know, they're not going to want to risk getting fined. So they're going to set their algorithms to pull down anything that might remotely come close to touching on this issue. And there's going to be a, a censorship bureau that, and, and, and uh, someone leading that that's going to tell these companies what to do. And we're, we're really very close to having, you know, outright government mandated political censorship on the Internet. So right now, Facebook and YouTube are doing a good job of it on their own, but we're getting close to the government actually mandating kind of what they want on the internet and what they don't. And this is very, and, and you know, Facebook and YouTube are already pulling things down in relation to COVID. I mean, you know, myself, I posted an article, it was a link from Reuters talking about how they're not vaccinating kids in, in the UK and I said, you know, the UK doctors have looked at the risk versus reward and they've decided not to do this. They said that that was COVID misinformation and I got pulled off Twitter for a period of time. Now we appealed it and thankfully I have a staff member who actually knows a high up person in Twitter and they were able to, to go and change it. But I mean, this is the kind of censorship that we're, we're seeing. And um, it's only gonna get worse. And the liberals are, um, I mean, you know, in, in this whole lo long document they put out in regards to, um, you know, c controlling the harmful nature of the Internet, not once do they, do they talk about free speech. Not once do they talk about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. You know, it's as if the Internet was made, for, you know, to cause harm and to be throttled. That was the, you know, the gist of the, the messaging that they're putting out. So this, you know, this is what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a liberal government that... Um, I mean, they're surely, they surely are corrupt, and I'm sure that we're going to see legitimate examples of their $500 billion going to places that it shouldn't be. There's, our, you know, there's one good example of a former liberal MP that manufactures ventilators, and they, and they paid well above market price for the ventilators. But this is the kind of thing you know, we're going to see more and more. But beyond that, we're seeing a government that is um, you know, patently totalitarian. I mean, listen, you know, communism doesn't necessarily come in overnight, okay? It's, it, it can be creeping. And what we're seeing now is, I mean, we're literally seeing like, a, a, like an office of censorship that they're proposing to set up with respect to, to, the, to the internet. And in terms of these rules where the, there has to be algorithms and all this, and then they may block uh, content from even coming into Canada. I mean, this is like China, right? I mean... China prevents all kinds of things from coming in. They have, you know, very strict rules about what you can post and what you can't post. So this is what we're doing here. And they're doing it in, under the guise of like kind of liberal language, like, you know, protecting this and that. But it's not liberal. It is totalitarian. It's, you know, uh, uh, nanny state. And, and this, is what we're, this is what we're seeing, and it's going to get worse. And we're seeing this on many levels. We're seeing, you know, a complicity when it, when it came to, you know, real cures for COVID. Because COVID is a real infection that people were actually dying from. Now, it's not the end of the world. And many people needn't be afraid of it. Um, in, the, in the 12 months from March of 2020 to April of 2021, 1,380 people under the age of 65 died from COVID-19. Okay. Now, that's not more than that, more than that, yeah, 1,380 people, okay? Statistics Canada says that in that same time period, 5,500 Canadians in that age range died that normally wouldn't. So it was a bump of 5,500 Canadians. So what that means is that because of how we responded to COVID-19, about 4,000 people in that age range died that presumably wouldn't have. I mean, we don't know for sure. We know that addictions are up. We know that suicides are up. We know that over opioid overdoses are up. We know that, you know, all of these things are up, but we have excess mortality of 5,500 
in that age group and only 1,300 of them died from COVID. So we're seeing that the, the very way that we responded to COVID-19 is more deadly than the, than the uh, virus itself. And there is a professor that did a study a little while ago at Simon Fraser University where he showed that the lockdowns were many times more harmful than they were helpful. And that's what we're seeing. And, you know, we, we're not seeing any of these governments um, apologize for responding this way. And we're seeing, in fact, some governments now, you know, I don't know what they'll do here in Alberta, but we're seeing some governments talking about, you know, bringing the kids back to school with masks again and social distancing and all this stuff. So there's been no awareness of what's gone on. There's been no apology for it. And frankly, as we go into now, again, you know, our cases are low relatively in July, but they were last year, too. The, you know, respiratory diseases do not do well in summers. So when we get into the flu season again and cases go up, we may see lockdowns again. In fact, we probably will see lockdowns in at least some, if not many, provinces. So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with, um, you know, censorship. We're dealing with lockdowns. We're dealing with a government that basically failed to look at all sorts of evidence that relates to, you know, treatments and so on for COVID-19. There's, there's ivermectin, there's fluvoxamine, there's seven or eight drugs that, you know, I, I, I'm on panels with doctors. I, I'm, I'm on a panel with 50 doctors from Canada and multiple doctors from the States that have, you know, testified before the Senate in the States. And they're showing me all the data and all these drugs. There's been something like 30 tests, 30 randomized controlled trials on ivermectin all of which are showing promise, early stage, mid stage, late stage, preventively, okay? And we're seeing, and this is a drug that's been around for 50 years, is pennies on the dollar, has been used over, I think, three billion times, and has a very safe profile. And yet they're saying, no, nope, you can't have that drug, but you must take this vaccine that by definition is in an experimental stage, okay? It's just, it just is. Right? It's, it, it takes a certain number of years to do the tests and all this kind of thing. So that's what they're doing to us. And more and more people are getting the vaccine because they're twisting arms. They're saying, listen, you can't go here. You can't go there. You can't travel. So I get it. But the fact is, is that if they're willing to do this to us now, when does it stop? Okay. And we have, I mean, they're buying booster after booster shot, right? They're, they're cranking up the, 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 um, the restrictions for people who, do, who choose not to do this. And we're seeing, of course, China throw their weight around more and more in this country and other places around the world. We're seeing a complete, um, our country is being sold out. Yes. And they're doing it basically knowingly. And they've been doing it for decades. And COVID-19 just revealed how bad it's gotten. It revealed how badly the government is not in tune with people, is not honest with the science, and how much they just don't want to, you know, they just don't want to, you know, open up. They don't want to stand, stand out on a limb on anything. They'd rather do the absolute safest thing all the time, even if it's the worst thing. So the question is really, what do we do? And frankly, we don't have any opposition in this, in this country. The, the legacy parties are entirely corrupt. None of them stood up on any of the issues that we were seeing in the, in the last, you know, 12 months. And they're talking about even worse things. I mean, there's people in you know, Parliament talking about zero COVID, right? It's like, you know, could we ever have zero flu? Yeah, we could maybe if we all stayed at home and never left, right? <laughs> and we never spoke to anyone or got close to anybody. But these things are not realistic. In fact, they're crazy. And we're seeing people promote these things. We're seeing, um, you know, everyone in Parliament, you know, the Conservatives you know, to their credit, are usually just quiet, okay? Now, I wish they would, you know, speak up, but most of the other parties are worse than the Liberals. So that whatever the Liberals are saying, the NDP, the Bloc, the Green Party are just egging them on even more. So we live in a country where we have a complete failure at the parliamentary level. And, you know, the average Canadian doesn't have the time to really watch what's going on, and they, you know, they kind of, you know, think that Canada is the same old place that it used to be. But COVID has really opened a lot of, a lot of eyes. And many Canadians are, are frustrated. And in fact, six out of 10 Canadians don't like any political party, federal political party. And that's a lot, that's 60%. That's a lot of people. There's a lot of different choices. You'd think, you know, that people would be able to find one that they, that they like. So 
we need a we need a new movement that's that's willing to willing to be honest, willing to you know govern with integrity, willing to stand up against the stuff that we're seeing, and willing to you know actually govern the country in favor of Canadians, because you know there's the, there's corruption that we see, and there, you know it's like an iceberg, right? When you see a bit of it, there's 90% of it that you're not seeing. So I have we have no idea how deep this is going. We saw a little bit of that last year when. Um, SNC Lavalin was was up on criminal charges, and then they were pressuring the, the justice minister to let them to let them go. But this is the type of thing that we're seeing, and there's a very cozy relationship between the liberals and all kinds of business interests in this country, in Quebec and other places, and it is ruining the country. And there's cozy relationships with many people in China, and they're selling this country out. And it's happening on our watch. So we need, a, we need a new movement that's willing to address this. And I've started one. I've put in papers for a new party. Good. Okay? <clears throat> and you know, I've heard some stories from Eric, who was involved in the early days of the Reform Party. And uh, you know, he's told me in the first couple of meetings, there was what, three guys at these meetings? Three, four people? And look what they did. New movements can and have gained traction before in Canada. And we're getting great turnout. At many, we had uh, meetings every day over the long holiday weekend, and we had 100 plus, 200 in uh, Okotoks just the other day. We're seeing hundreds of people come out saying that they want something new. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to start it here, and we're going to um, spread across, across the country. Now, hopefully the election is not called you know, tomorrow, but listen, we're gonna, if we have to start small, then we'll start small. But if we get a few months, if we get a few months runway, we're gonna expand and we already have people organizing in different parts of the country. We have high level people organizing for us in different parts of the country. We have someone who helped Stephen Harper set up the, the first time the Conservatives won in Quebec. All of those candidates, this guy set up, he's setting candidates for us up in Quebec. So we have serious people organizing for us in every province and if we get a, you know, a little bit of time, we'll field, field candidates. And if we only have a little bit of time, we'll field five or six. But the fact is, is that, listen, if, if, if even three candidates, if even two candidates won on this movement, that would send you know, a huge message to the Conservatives, to everybody else. Yep. Nope. Nope. You could run one candidate if you want. No, you can run, you, you need to promote at least one candidate. In every province? Nope, anywhere. Just one, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we will run as many candidates as we can. But listen, hopefully the election won't be called right away. Hopefully it'll be called a little bit later. But that's what we're working on. And of course, there's other options. There's the Maverick Party, there's the PPC, and, and things of this nature, okay? Now, the reason why I'm starting a party is because whether it's Maverick or PPC or what I'm doing, nobody really has any traction, okay? Yes, the PPC's been around for a little bit, but they don't have any seats in Parliament, okay? Everyone's basically starting from scratch, okay? So if we're gonna start from scratch, we might as well start with the best option. And, and for several reasons, I believe that my party is the better option. You guys can decide that. The, the, the vacuum in the room is going to align with one of these movements. I think the Maverick Party is a failure because primarily they said nothing about COVID-19 or the lockdowns, nothing. They also are a separatist party, okay? I don't think a separatist party has any, uh, they're useless at the federal level. If you wanna get something done, you do it provincially. If you wanna be a separatist, now I'm not a separatist, but I have many people that follow me, you know, there's some that, that are. But the fact is, is you can, the, the things you want to get done are at the provincial level. The Maverick Party cannot decide that Alberta is going to secede. They will never form government and they will never pass a major bill in Parliament. They will stand there and, you know, maybe say a good speech or two, but they will never form government or pass a bill. And when it comes to actually separating, that's something you guys have to decide provincially anyways. So they won't be able to accomplish anything. They didn't say anything about COVID-19 and they also want to avoid anything controversial. They've said that. 
So they don't care about any of the values issues. So I don't know how you can, you know, trust a party like that to stand up for your, your interests, because they haven't been. Uh, you know, and as for the People's Party, there's some good things about them, okay? But they've been around now for three years. They don't have a constitution. They don't have a leadership review. They don't have, you know, a, a way for members to really be involved. It's too long, okay? We need a party that actually is, it functions democratically. So if they, you know, if they had a few people in parliament or something, maybe I would have joined them. But we're all starting from scratch. And if we're gonna start from scratch, if, you, if you're building from scratch, you might as well build the house you want. Okay, if it's already half built, then you know, maybe we can deal with it. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. But the fact is, is that the mainstream parties in this country are broken. They'll never stand up for our interests and we need to get this country back. And that's what this party will do. It will focus not so much on left or right ideologies, but on, on what's good for Canada. Okay, so what's good for Canadians? What is, you know, what's honest? What's, what's helpful for the, for the average person? So this is the type of thing that we need. And uh, hopefully within a couple of weeks, our party uh, will be approved and uh, you guys can all join. So, <laughs> so listen, I, so I, I'm gonna take a bunch of questions but that's the gist of what, I was, what I'm here to tell you about tonight. And, and we've been to, I, I lost track now, eight or eight, nine, something like this, places in Southern Alberta. And we've spoke to thousands of people already. And this is just in the past week. So we're just getting started. And we're not gonna stop until we, until we can take this country back and make politics fun again. I mean, no one likes politics anymore. It's boring. No one answers any questions. It's true. And it's, I mean, you know, that's why no one watches what's going on. No one answers questions and everything they do is boring. You know, they just talk about, you know, fake problems and their fake solutions. So time to make politics fun again, time to make Alberta great again, and time to make Canada free again. Okay. Okay, so, um, so in Alberta, obviously, the dominant party is the Conservatives. It's different in other places. But so in, in this area, all right, um, you know, 72% voted Conservative last time. Liberals, NDP, all of that, you know, were like 8% or less. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's the Conservatives here. Um, how many people think Aaron O'Toole is going, has a chance at winning and Blake Richards in this riding is going to be the linchpin that pushes them from not winning to winning. Anybody? Okay. Well, the, okay, so we have a gentleman back here who's not sure. Okay, the, the polls for the Conservatives right now are very poor. Okay? The Conservatives are trailing the Liberals by double-digit points in every single, almost every poll. Not every poll, but 9 out of 10 polls. Okay? And in some areas of the country, they're 20 points behind. The good areas where they need to win. Yeah, you have something to say? Just, yeah. I, I just want to know if those polls that you're talking about are really trustworthy. Because yeah. a lot of polls are not trustworthy. Yeah. Are, are I mean, I, I would say yes, just because they're all saying this. It's, I'm not picking like one random poll. I'm picking, you know. It's, a, it's an aggregate of like all the polls. So nearly all of them are showing double digit okay. gaps. Okay. Leading up to the 2019 election, the, poll, the polls were very close. Okay. They, were, they were very, very close. And you saw what happened in 2019. Okay. So you know, even with close polls, it can kind of swing either way. But these are, these are far polls. Okay. So the, the, the Conservatives do not really have a chance of winning this election. Okay, very low. There's about a 5% chance that they'll form a minority and a 95% chance that the Liberals will, for, will form some kind of a government. You know, if, as things stand today. Okay? But the problem with the Conservatives is that they've gone down in the polls every single month since O'Toole was elected leader. So I don't think we're going to see a huge uptick. I mean, they've lost, I think, six points or so since he, since he became leader. So they're not going in the right direction. So 
as, as for vote splitting, I don't believe vote splitting is really an issue. Okay, you have, you have six out of 10 Canadians that don't like any federal political party. You have the Conservatives in a position where they're not going to win anyways. And you have, uh, you know, we're at a crisis point in this country where we need to send a clear message. Now, I think we can actually win. If we have enough time, I think we can, we can win a lot of ridings. If we have a short amount of time, maybe we can win a couple of ridings. But that's sending a great message, okay? It's sending a great message. It's sending a message that you will not be ignored. It's sending a message that you're fed up and it will strike fear. If we, ele if we elect, if even I am reelected, it will strike fear into the hearts of the, the establishment in Ottawa. Now, I think not only can we elect me again, I think we can elect several others. And if we have time, who knows? The sky's the limit, okay? So I think it's entirely possible, and that's what we're gonna aim to do. Right here. If your party succeeds, what's your stance on lockdowns? Well, I have six court summons on my desk at home for fighting <laughs> lockdown orders. So, no, our party is against lockdowns, and, and we will take a province to court if they, if they do a blanket lockdown again. <clears throat> Don't believe in that either. Yeah, no one will be, no one's rights will be reduced publicly or privately. <clears throat> yeah. No passports. Yeah, and I say privately too, because right now you have someone like Jason Kenney say that he's passing a law that will make, you know, mandatory vaccines illegal, but yet a, 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 a workplace can still say you must be vaccinated. Well, they're getting funding for it too. Yes. 